Good morning, Darren. How are you? Great. How are you doing, Gwen? I'm okay. Sitting here. I mean, I always work from home, so it's actually not that much of a difference for me. I just spend more time on Zoom than I used to, but it's different for you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've we've transitioned pretty seamlessly into this uh, work from home environment, and uh, yeah, things seem to be working out pretty well, to be quite honest. Yeah, you're spending lots of time on Zoom, I'm sure, talking to institutions and investors all over the place. Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, I've I've probably done you know. 20, 30, 40 Zoom calls this week, it seems like, uh, you know, I, I was uh, marketing a few weeks back to uh, to the UK and I was uh, actually pretty impressed. It's uh, it's saying something, you can do a, a meeting in the city in London and then have an hour later schedule a meeting for the West End and make it and not worrying about the taxis and everything else and, and the cost of getting over there. So it's it's actually quite effective in terms of communicating and, and bringing people, you know, an update to, to your own story. One thing, since we're talking about this, um, and since you're a, a stock that fits the, um, that I think at least fits the bill for a lot of what um, investors are interested in, how has, so let me just preface that. I mean, I think investors are turning to this space. I think gold stands out for many reasons. I've talked to my subscribers a lot about that. I think especially the sort of more generalist investors, the not gold specific investors who are coming in are going to start with assets that are lower risk, that offer grade, because that's a protection, um, and that have some upside to them, if they're not just buying Barrick and Newmont and, and ETFs. Um, and so I think Pure Gold fits that bill. From your end, how? what is your incoming calls? Have they changed? Do you have different people reaching out to you? Have you noticed a change in the interest level? I'm, I'm, sort, I'm very curious how it's played out for you um, from where you sit. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I think we're seeing a little bit more interest in, in the space. Uh, we're seeing more generalist interest in a broader, you know, a broader base with respect to, you know, it's time to old gold and gold equities. And, and as you said, I'm, you know, I'm certain you've talked to your subscribers about it. But I think even before this, you know, this, this COVID-19 black swan event, uh, we were already going down a path that was seeing increasing economic uncertainty. So, you know, government's been printing money, QA has been on on uh, on on a spiral since the uh, subprime crisis, uh, we've got interest rates across the planet that are pushing, you know, zero percent and lower, and so all that's translating into what I think is a pretty buoyant market for for gold. Uh, but what what was really I think is important and special about you know our particular situation is that we're we're a Canadian based operation, and so we've got a, a double advantage where we're seeing a you know again a strong gold market. But uh, in Canada's case, uh, you know, right now we're bailing out everybody. Um, it's going to take a while to get out of this. We're seeing oil prices today that are pushing zero and even negative. And so we've seen that Canadian dollar decline such that uh, we've got the, you know, the best of both worlds where you've got a strong gold environment, a low Canadian dollar, and a Canadian dollar gold price that's sitting, it seems, records on a daily basis. So I think that's driving attention to, to Canadian stories. Mm -hmm. And I think the other aspect of this is, um, you know, we're in a strong regulatory environment. Uh, you know, we, we have certainty of ownership. We're not worried about a coup. And uh, again, that gives us an advantage with respect to having certainty around not just production today, but long-term production. Yeah. And certainly, though, I mean, I, I think those are valid points for sure. When you get into periods of uncertainty and within those arising gold price, um, less stable jurisdictions, absolutely the risk is real that royalties will rise or property grabs will happen. That We've mm -hmm. seen that many times before, so that's, a, that's, a, that's an important point. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's also, when you talk about this very strong Canadian dollar gold price, I mean, investors who are rotating into this space, and we know that the generalists are the fuel that kicks a gold bull market, really makes it happen. Um, you know, they're, they're not gold experts, but they're often, you know, they can crunch numbers and the pure gold story definitely offers that even just in the, the small, shall I call it? Not, it's not a small mine, but in the, the, the mine that you're building now, which is the, the initial iteration of what you're envisioning um, at Madsen, it really matches. Like if, if just someone's just looking at numbers, pure gold really has that to offer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, you know, we were attractive a year ago when we put a feasibility study out and it was uh, priced at 12.75 US dollars per ounce an exchange rate of, of 75 cents, which translates into 1700 Canadian. And then bear in mind, again, all of our costs are Canadian dollar costs. You know, today we're looking at uh, close to 1700 US gold price uh, exchange rate that's dropped down to 0.7 and that's 2400 Canadian. So you're talking about a change of $700 an ounce and that's pure margin. 
Right. So, you know, it, you're right. It's a phase development approach. We, we made a conscious decision, you know, a while back here to, to take advantage of a brownfield site with existing infrastructure and the ability to bring on near-term cash flow in a, uh, in a market that was, that was difficult to raise funds. Uh, but it's very much a phased approach. And we really see this as, as just the beginning of a, a long path to growth on the property. So let's talk about the construction process right now in, in two aspects, where you are, how it's going. I mean, you're certainly targeting gold, bef first gold before the end of the year. There's not that many mines mm -hmm. under construction right now. So that stands out on its own. And then COVID, what kind of impacts has that had on, yeah, your ability to build a mine? Yeah, uh, we'll speak to COVID first. So it's a, um, you know, clearly this is uh, it's it's been very disruptive across the planet, uh, and and we reacted pretty pretty quickly or proactively, I would say, um, back in February. It started to monitor it, put systems and policies in place, and uh, you know, at the mine site uh, today in Ontario, it's been declared an essential service, and and that covers the whole range of uh, of mining activities from exploration through mine construction uh, operations into reclamation and closure. Uh, but to, to kind of manage things, we've got, uh, you know, corporately we're working from home. Uh, the, the engineering procurement team are working from home, uh, communicating effectively using platforms just like this. Uh, we've got on-site our technical services group. Uh, those who can work from home are working from home. And we've implemented things to kind of, you know, minimize uh, the interaction with each other with respect to physical distancing, staggered times in the lunchroom, staggered changes through the mind dry and the correct PPE and so forth. We're doing pre-screening pre pre of uh, shift changes and all the contractors that come on site uh, to look for anything that's symptomatic, uh, temperature checks at the gate and so forth. So, so we put in the policies to, to manage things. And I think that in some respects, the mining industry is, is pretty well prepared for this type of event. Um, Having said all that, it's it's an area that we're we're watching. You know, obviously we are building a mine, and we've got a number of procurement packages in, in you know orders that have been placed. Uh, to date, we've probably ordered about uh, eighty plus percent of of the packages by value, so that's well advanced, and certainly pricing is locked into that. But it's an area where we watch closely to see if there's any impacts or delays on on things that we need to build the mine. And thus far, we're we're on track, you know, on schedule, on budget for for school by by the end of the year. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know for sure. Um, uh, and then I don't even, I asked a two part question and I don't even remember what the other part was. Anyway, we can move on. <laughs> I'm sure the listeners will remember. <laughs> right. And then they can tell me afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, and then uh, shifting the discussion a bit, I think, I mean, the investor interest coming into the gold space is obviously really important. That's what's pushing major gold stocks up to, you know, the highs that they haven't seen since the last bull market. Um, that's a really important force. Within all of this, I also think an important factor is that major gold miners are in a really strong position. They have robust balance sheets. They have strong earnings because of the gold price. Um, and at some, what they don't have in, in at least a fair number of cases are, uh, are strong pipelines. So there's a lot of discussion these days around who's going to start buying what, when, and we're certainly starting to see some deals and whatnot. Um, I'm sure you get this question all the time and you talk to majors all the time who are keeping tabs on pure gold and Madsen. Um, what do you what, what do you say first of all in general about the M&A landscape? I mean, you've been in the industry for a long time. What kind of outlook do you have on what shape it might take? What kinds of assets the majors want? What kind of emphasis they put on exploration upside for a project like like Madsen? Yeah, I mean, certainly the you know the pipeline is shrinking. There hasn't been a lot of uh, you know there really hasn't been a lot of new discoveries over over the last years, and part of that is a reflection of of not a lot of money coming into the earlier stages of, of exploration. And so that pipeline, if you will, has been shrinking over quite some time. And certainly over the last several years, I've seen the corporate development groups become more active to start to, to be a little bit more attentive to what's happening in our space and, and following stories that have that potential to grow into not just, not just large assets, but also um, high margin assets. Yeah. There has been a bit of a change or focus uh, more on not only does it have the scale that we're looking for, but what is what does the cash flow look like at the end of the day, and and I think that um, you know the seniors they're looking at the same things that, that we all look at you know what is the risk here, um, what is the capital that is required to put something into production, and at the end of the day what is it going to generate both from a, an ounce perspective and a, a cash flow perspective, mm -hmm. and certainly you know I think we would reflect well on on that scale, um, 
you look at, uh, you know, Canadian assets do typically come under premium uh, and, uh, and you can highlight several examples of that. You look at West Dome today's trading at one and a half billion dollars uh, on, a, on a mine that's producing, you know, about 100,000 ounces a year. We saw um, Richmond's Island Gold transact for a billion dollars. Integra One went for $650 million. So we've seen a series of M&A transactions in Canada that really reflect that desire for high margin assets with strong growth profile and low risk. Mm -hmm. And I think certainly you have the strong margin, you have the low risk for jurisdiction, and the exploration um, is clearly there. So let's talk about exploration a little bit now. It's, I'm sure a lot of conversations for Pure Gold gravitate towards the fact that you're building a mine and what that's, how that's going and what numbers that's going to spit out. But let's take a second to capture um, what your focus is on exploration right now and, and what sort of news results that might put out in the next, uh, in the next while. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question. It's something clearly that uh, we're really excited about. You know, we talked about a phased development approach. And when you look at the numbers, the numbers are what the numbers are. But but that's not the mine that we set out to build. It is very much the first of, of several phases, if you will. And so we took a fraction of our resource. So we put it through a feasibility plan. We're, we're building on that right now. But we've made several discoveries outside of that that footprint, if you will. So you, you step down the south of the, for the, uh, of the mineral deposit. You have things that we called fork, wedge. Uh, Russ itself, they're all part of the same system and they're, they're discoveries that we made effectively applying the geological knowledge we've gained over the last several years. And we've, uh, you know, we put out hundreds of, of hybrid hits on those. They form part of a mineral resource. We've already started doing early stage scoping work from an engineering perspective on how we might incorporate those into our mine plan. And so from a, a goal perspective, you know, we want to continue to drill those. They're at surface, they're open expand those resources, ultimately incorporate them into a, a future reserve and mine plan and, uh, and potentially look at a, a, you know, an increase in throughput at the same time. Uh, so exploration focus will continue to focus on those areas, uh, can, growing those resources. Uh, we're also really quite excited about uh, some recent work that we've done um, targeting up dip expansions of the, the eight zone. So Gwen, if you recall, the eight zone is, is very high grade. Uh, it's, it's our high grade zone, if you will. It's, it's a little bit deeper in our mine plan and it is open for expansion, both up and down dip. Uh, we initially, when we acquired this property, we, we did something really simple. We kind of projected up to surface and started drilling that area. And now today we have a resource, in what we call Russ's South, which really is the, the up dip expression of the eight zone at depth. Uh, more recently, we drilled midway between it, about 500 meters above the eight zone, and we achieved uh, um, an economic intercept in a broad zone that was about 50 meters of, of a gram. And so we're excited about that. It's an opportunity to expand a very high grade component of our mineral resource. And it just sets up another target framework, if you will, for, for further work. Hmm. Yeah. And I, just to circle back to the the M&A side of things. Not that that's necessarily the outcome for pure gold. You can certainly build a mine and make a bunch of money on your own and you're well down the path to that. But when majors are looking at assets, clearly in the situation of Madsen, the mine is already being built. So they wouldn't be able to change the mine that is being built. It's, it's well on its path. So there must be a huge amount of focus on the regional package and what sort of opportunities there are down the road. Um, so yeah, I'm sure you spend a lot of time going through models and theories and whatnot with those sorts of parties. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We've got, you know, 47 square kilometers of kind of a key fertile piece of Red Lake geology. Uh, we've got, um, you know, one of the, one of what I would call the two important trends in the camp. And uh, we've established a mineral system that spans over seven kilometers of strike length uh, on our ground. And it's open across that seven kilometers. So, you know, when you look at, uh, it's interesting, when you look at uh, Pure Lakes, Pure Gold's Red Lake mine today, um, and you look at it in a cross section against the the evolution red lake mine they're similar in very many respects in the same strike length the same expression uh, geologically they're in the same rocks the same timing the same structures and really the difference is when you think about it is that we're about 30 years behind so if you pull 30 years of mining away from the red lake mine to the north of us it would look just like what our resource looks like today right uh, we've got drilling down to 2.1 kilometers to suggest it's open and we're, we're really excited about that being the longer term uh, focus of, of mineral growth and, and exploration. Cool. Um, anything else that we should touch on for people who are uh, interested in the story? Well, I think, you know, just to reiterate, uh, we are the next gold mine to come on stream in Canada. Uh, we are high grade and everyone says they're high grade, but to put it in perspective, uh, what in production will be the fifth highest grade mine in Canada, the 17th highest grade mine in the, the world. 
Uh, but it really is only the beginning. And so, you know, we're targeting first gold core by Christmas, but uh, we're already, you know, we've already drilled off resources along strike. Uh, we're already doing early stage engineering work on those. And the, the real objective here is to show that strong growth profile in a buoyant market where we're seeing, you know, again, all time record highs in Canadian dollar terms. Fantastic. Well, uh, good luck keeping it all on track. I know that building, I mean, I don't have personal experience, but I've had lots of conversations about how building a mine is in from your position involves keeping a lot of balls up in the air at the same time. So, uh, so I hope, I hope that works. I hope you continue to manage that. I'm sure you can, but it's a daily challenge. I'm, I'm sure. Absolutely. Um, appreciate it. And thanks very much for your time, Gwen. Absolutely. We'll check in again soon. Cheers. Bye. -bye. Bye.